Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving a light for those who long had gone, had gone, guiding the wise men on their way unto a place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Christmas miracle. We're continuing in our series today, The Scandal That Saves You. And you may think, well, that's an interesting introduction by name, A Scandal That Saves. We're in Matthew chapter 1. I'm not going to read 1 through 25. We'll pick up around verse 18 here in a few moments. But as Christians, we celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus. And of course, he is the promised Messiah. Now, Jesus came to bring hope. And I'm sure glad today because I'm glad I have that hope living within me. I'm glad I've experienced his forgiveness, which was another thing that he has provided for us today. And he came to change the hearts of people for whoever will put their confidence and their faith and receive the Lord into their life will be changed. Just not for a moment, but you're changed forever. Now, Jesus is about miracles of transformation. And that's exactly what it does. That's what Paul describes to in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And he talks about that if you're in Christ, you're a new creature, a new creation. Your life is completely changed. So when we talk about Jesus changing hearts of people, we're not talking about physical hearts. Uh, we're not talking today about the physical body. We're talking about spiritual hearts. And then it changes us, and that involves today our will and our total being. But what Jesus does on the inside shows evidence and uh, on the outside. As he changes our heart, he changes our life, he changes our motive, he changes our direction, he changes everything about us. And when you understand the true meaning of Christmas today, it will bring about a change in your heart and will also change the outlook in your life today. Your outlook changes. Your outlook changes. Your faith 
is then anchored in the Lord. I've watched over the last two weeks. Derek's been in the hospital two weeks. And I've watched the evidence of their faith. I've known this couple over 20 years. And, and, and I've known their faith. But then I've seen the evidence of their faith, of the change that God has wrought, and the stability in going through a horrendous surgery of what God does. Same thing with Jane. Same thing with Shauna and Brian. The same thing with many of you. You see the outlook of your faith changes. You're not down, defeated, and depressed and given up. You're looking up, you're trusting God, and you know your Redeemer lives and can do great and mighty things. So in, this, in the Christmas carol, y'all all know, and we'll probably all see this on TV, I don't like it have a color enhanced it. I like to go back and see the old Christmas carol story of Scrooge in the black and white. It just gives something about it, you know. It's just totally different. Scrooge lived a miserable life of greed. And you know what? There's still a lot of Scrooges out there today. And, uh, but when he awoke from the sobering encounter with the ghost of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future, Scrooge sees then his empty, bitter life for what it really is. And, you know, we have to look in that same direction today. Scrooge wants his life to change. So he humbles himself and he retraced the steps of his offenses and, he, that had, and basically that had been committed on that Christmas Eve. As he did, he revealed a remarkable change of heart, didn't he? And even in what is a Hollywood production, you can see evidence of what real change will do to you of what God will change in your life. So Scrooge's life changes. Instead of grasping, he is now giving. And instead of being bitter, he is now today loving. And instead of being indifferent to the needs of others, he's now caring for the needs of others. You know, that all exactly, giving, loving, and caring. That is real important. And it's just not something we do in a framework of one week or one day of the year. It's something that should be prevalent in our lives every day, shouldn't it? We should today be people that are giving, loving, and caring people today. And Scrooge's life is, is a transformation that he went from humbug to hallelujah. And you know what? Your life can be that way. I talk to people, and you know, I can't stand Christmas. I just be glad when it's over. I can't stand the shopping. I can't stand all the food. I can't stand all the people. I can't stand all the craziness and all this other stuff. Enjoy it. Amen. Enjoy it. Thank God for the blessings that you have. Thank God for all the things. I saw a video Tom showed me that he and Sabrina decorated their house. And I've got to, I've got to motor out in that direction one night here this week and see it for real. There, they live on a corner lot. And let me tell you, from this end to that end and everything in between is lights. Christmas lights, a nativity scene, Christmas trees, lights around the windows, lights, 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 lights. And it just reflects and emanates a spirit of rejoicing. Amen. Because we know the light of the world. And so, you know, Christmas is not a time of defeat and discouragement and bitterness and grumbling and being a Scrooge or the Grinch and painting yourself green. It's a time of celebration. It's the time we praise the Lord. The birth of Jesus brought many dramatic changes, but I believe the greatest is a changed heart produced, that produces a changed life. Let's go to Matthew 1. Pick up with verse 18. You're familiar with these scriptures. Something different here, though. As we read in Matthew's account, see what Matthew is bringing to us today, because honestly, it's kind of like a scandal of sorts. Well, if you go to Luke and you read, and the angels were rejoicing, and the shepherds, and, and the wise men, and, and the glory to God in the highest, and all this drama and pageantry and glory and all this stuff, you know, you think, whoa. But it's a different picture here. Listen to what happens. Now, the birth of Jesus was on the wise when his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph. That word espouse means betrothed. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Uh-oh. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. That doesn't mean he was on locker in the back room. 
that meant he would be seeking in that tradition of what culture demanded would be of what we know as a divorce of sorts. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thy son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, going back to that verse there, 19, um, also not only to be in a position, but in those days, if you were caught in a position like this, it were perceived as, she could be stoned to death. She could lose her life. So he was thinking to try to protect her, try to provide for her, try to take the high road, all those things. But then the angel of the Lord spoke to him, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Can you imagine being Joseph and the angel of the Lord appears to you in a dream and tells you that? What would you do? You'd get up and take about three antacid pills and think, man, what did I eat last night? Amen. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Remember Isaiah said that. Which being interpreted is what? God with us. Oh man, I'm glad that's there. Then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took him, and took unto him his wife, and knew not her, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Every religion that has ever existed has some sort of, of this thing of God with us. That is a hallmark of our Christian faith. That is a major part of what of our belief system today is knowing that God is with us. Just not when it's sunshine and pretty and great in our lives. And I'm not talking about the elements outside. I'm talking about within the confines of your life. But when you, those rainy, hard, tough places come in your life, you still know it's God with us. Let's get it more personal. It's God with me. It's God with you today. Adam and Eve had it in the garden but lost it because of their sin. They had the presence of God with them. He had been with them. But they basically sinned and brought shame upon the name of God. And ever since that first man and woman, they've sinned and all have sinned. And we've all ached because of our sin. Sin comes with a price tag. It comes with a consequence, doesn't it? So we have groaned. We want God with us. We want the truth. We even want that feeling, God, with us. We want to anchor our, our soul on that today. But how much better would it be if God were with us? But if we were not born sinful, if the world wasn't fallen, and you see the situation, if people didn't kill one another, if cancer did not exist, can you imagine? Well, that's the world the way it was. Until sin entered on the scene. I mean, can you imagine today? Hatred is filling our land today. In every capacity, hatred. But it does not have to exist. But let me tell you what brought it about. The culprit is sin. And people sinning. So we groan in the darkness of the empty promises of shattered families. And we wish if God could just be with us. So we live in this fallen life. We go through life and we find ourselves staggering and stumbling through life. And then we come up to the story that we read in Matthew chapter 1 that I just shared with you. The story of God with us. Isaiah had already prophesied and declared this as we talked about here uh, other week. And then the story of Matthew 1 is probably not like the more popular story I was telling you about in the book of Luke. This is not the one that we read to our families on Christmas Eve. This is the one that we just kind of bypass and go to the next Matthew, Mark, Luke, to the third gospel. This story that we like to read is found in Luke chapter 2. So the story in Luke is one that is grand. It's one that's sweeping. It's one that shepherds are watching their flock by night and the angel appears unto them and brings them uh, the glory of God, proclaiming glory to God in the highest. 
And can you imagine the scene and what they were experiencing? The message is peace on earth and goodwill toward men. I mean, that's the message we want to hear, isn't it? We don't want to hear the, the stories that have a bit of wonder of a different proportion attached to it. But what happens here, we see in Matthew, honestly, because Mary was in a position that she's going to birth a child, that Joseph had not had any affair with her. She was conceived of the Holy Spirit. How do you explain that? And not only that, but Joseph is kind of in a, what is going on here? You're going to have a child? What's this stuff about being conceived of the Holy Ghost? I mean, you put yourself in his position. How would you feel? Uh, Matthew's account is one where there's really not peace, but you look at it and you think about the word scandal. How did this happen? There's only one hesitation. There's only one pain. And so Luke sets up and gives us Mary and Matthew pauses and he looks back at Joseph. And in the process, Matthew wants us to feel the pain of Joseph. He wants you to feel what his heart was dealing with and the pain that he was going through. He wants us to see that was Joseph's hesitation. Let's not pick on Joseph because you and I would have had that same hesitation. We would not been comfortable with that situation. So Matthew wants us to think about the scandal of Jesus, of what would be perceived as. So Matthew opens the story in Matthew 1 with the birth of Jesus. <laughs> he just gets right to the point. So the birth took place in this way. When Mary had become betrothed, rather understand to be betrothed, of course, was a legal sanction about actual marriage. So to be betrothed or spoused. <coughs> So they were betrothed, they were married, but before they became man and wife, there was a scandal. All of a sudden, Mary is now going to have a baby. Guess what, Joseph? What, honey? I'm going to have a baby. What? What'd you say? Did you dream this? Who told you this? I mean, you think about it. So Mary's with child. Mary is pregnant. Going to have a baby. And of course she's with child. And this child is from the Holy Spirit. But Joseph didn't know that. And if he didn't know that, he didn't understand that, did he? So there was, there was tremendous tension that Joseph felt in this process. There's a problem. So Joseph, now let's look at him for a moment. He's a righteous man, a good guy. He has no desire to hurt Mary. He wants to take the high road. He wants to do the right things. a matter of fact... He had real in-depth fondness in his heart and love for Mary. She was his wife. And the last act of love would be for Joseph making it a quiet matter. And that's exactly what he was seeking to do. He would divorce her quietly. But in verse 20, it's weighing on Joseph's heart. So in the pressure and the weariness of this situation, Joseph falls asleep and there's a dream. I mean, have you ever gotten so tied up, messed up, intense, in stress that you just, and I tell you, one of the hallmarks of depression is <sighs> you're always so tired. All you want to do is lay down and sleep. You just want to get away from it all. You know what that solves? Nothing. Not a thing. You better watch that because it will creep up on you. So he falls asleep. But understand this is a part of God's plan. And there would be a dream and the Lord would speak unto him. And in verse 20, Joseph is called, this is pretty interesting, he's called the son of David. And this is the only place this occurs other than Jesus being called son of David. So there's a difference here. What was God's intention by Joseph being addressed as son of David. What was the reason, the rationale behind that? God was impressing Joseph that he was part of the plan that God had established. See, God has a plan in everything that he does. In this process, and Mary being conceived by the Holy Spirit, the pos position and the picture of Joseph, everything about that. And then we look at our lives and we say, I just don't understand why this is happening to me, why I'm going through this, why I'm in this situation. Because God has a plan for you. And the plans that God has for you is not defeat but delight. The plans that God has for you today is not to push you down but to lift you up. The plans for God is not to destroy you but to deliver you. 
And we've got to look at it in that sense today. You face those valleys. You face those issues. You face those dark days. But let me tell you what. Even in the darkness of life, God is with you today. Amen. So the angel of the Lord explained that this seed was, that was in Mary was from the Holy Spirit. So Joseph was faced then with pretty much a hard decision for his part. This part would be very costly to him. Mary would be the natural mother. Joseph would be the adopted father. So how does that pan out? Mary is going to have a son, and his name would be called Jesus, which in, is Joshua from the Old Testament. And it's a common name, and that name simply means Yahweh saves, Jesus or God saves, or Yeshua. Yeshua. So from the end result... The end result will be this, God saving his people from their sins. See the plan God would brought? See the, God, the plan that he would bring forth? And you know, it's amazing that God chooses to do what he does. He doesn't use the normal. He doesn't use the routine. He doesn't do in our thinking what is n normal. He does the extraordinary. Because whatever he does doesn't bring normal results. It brings extraordinary results. And he's an extraordinary God that wants to do something extraordinary in your life and mine. So stop living today in the just seeing what you see. Start living by faith and seeing what God sees. I hope you got that. Because you need to do that. We're so fixed on what we're in and seeing and going around us and what's happening in our lives. We don't see the God who's with us and what he is doing and the results that he is going to bring. And even when you have not arrived, I'm sorry, I'm trying to teach, but this thing is too good to teach. You've got to preach a little bit of it. Amen. When you start seeing the magnitude and the power and the greatness of what our God has done, what our God is doing, and what God's about to do, you just can't be in the normal capacity. You've got to reach out by faith and say, oh, what a mighty God we serve. Amen. 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 So everything is about to change. And whatever you're in today, I want you to tell you, I want to tell you, everything is about to change. Amen. This virgin can see, bearing a son, calling his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us, will change what? The hearts of men. It will change every person who will come and receive and trust him. So Joseph, he awakens from this dream and he does what God has commanded him. Oh, this is the key. You know, he could have said, hmm, okay, I'm going to choose my way. See, our ways are Lord's. As a matter of fact, Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, his ways are higher than the heavens. If his ways are higher than the heavens, aren't we then much smarter to choose his ways than our ways? Isn't it better to and just getting by to exceed? And that's exactly what God wants you to do. He wants to bring in an abundance of heaven into your life today. But you've fixed your mind because you're too busy seeing what you're in. And you can't see God in what's going on. And so therefore you're willing to, you're willing to receive or sacrifice or receive the lesser. You just want to get by. When God says, I got something greater than getting by for you. I want to do something exceeding abundantly in your life. And you've got to cooperate. Yeah. Do you have to go through stuff sometimes? Absolutely. Do you have to face trials in your life? Yes, you do. But you remember who's on the throne. Who has brought you through. Who's the, the God of heaven that can do great and mighty things in your life. So he took Mary, his wife. And when, when baby, uh, the boy Jesus came forth, he called his name Jesus. He did it exactly the way God told him to do it. Jesus came into this world in what would be perceived as a scandal. The infant Jesus would become a man. He would live a perfect life. He would die on a cross. And you know what? Only he could come back from the dead and do what he has done. The scandal of his birth foreshadows the scandal of his death because there was a scandal even in his death. His coming is power. And folks, the power of God is only found in Jesus today. So today we celebrate Jesus, the God-man, that takes away the darkness, the plagues of our sin, that separates us from God, and then we are adopted into the family of God, and we've made heirs and joint heirs, sons and daughters of the Most High God. We celebrate Jesus because that very name means today God saves. And I'm glad that we have done and experienced that today. Jesus Christ, although born in a common way, in a nowhere town of insignificance, 
to a nondescript couple stands completely alone today in who he is and what he will do in your life. So let me show you today a unique, the unique glory found over the next couple minutes, and I only have a few left. Show you what is found in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God with us. Establish that fact. First point, Jesus comes to us like no other. So the child Mary has, he is from the Holy Spirit, is from God. And the event is utterly unique in every fashion, form, and everything about it. So there has never been another child to enter the world like this one. Because this was God taking on the robe of flesh would mean incarnate, fully God, fully man. How could God do this? Because he's God. So the Bible tells us about a remarkable birth. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Word of God brings that attention today. In his mother's womb, and he leaped, the Bible says. And so therefore, he was set aside before he was even born. Amen. But there has never been a child conceived by the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus she was a virgin mother. She was a virgin before he came. She was a virgin after he came. Because this was a miraculous birth. So it was a natural impossibility, if you would, today. But it would be a supernatural reality that it happened. This is the doctrine of incarnation. And friend, let me tell you, the incarnation is the foundation of our Christian faith today. If you don't believe the incarnation of Jesus Christ, then what can you believe? You can't believe the rest of the Bible because that's the foundation that it's built upon. So if Jesus Christ is not born of a virgin, he is like every other man or person. And if he is like every other man, he can't save. And therefore, there's no gospel, there's no hope. And we're just going to die in our sins and go to hell. But I'm glad that's not the way it is. Hallelujah. Part of the reason of the virgin birth today is to remind us that salvation did not come from man, but it came from God. Therefore, listen, the miracle of, in the New Testament today are not just there. They're there for us today to know that God is with us, for us to realize, recognize, and understand how real that God is. See, God is with the sick. Aren't you glad? God is with those who are poor in spirit. God is with the broken and the bruised in life. I'm talking about just basically what life brings to us today. God is with the anxious. And you know what he does in our anxiousness? He calms us. God is with the rich. You know what? He even calls them to himself. See, God just didn't come to save lost poor people. He came to save all people. Amen. God is with the wayward to warn them and to bring them and to provide salvation for them. God is with the leper. He cleansed them. That leprous is a type of sin. The only cleansing for our sin is the blood of Jesus. He is the one that is with the disease. You know what he does? He cures them. I walked down the halls of the hospital this morning thinking, hallelujah. As I was walking out, guess what I heard? Code blue in ER, code blue in ER. And I just said, Lord, you can take care of that too. I look back, that hospital reeks with what? Sickness, disease, pain, problems, heartache, headache. But let me tell you what, what's greater than that is our God. For he is an able God. He's with the hungry to feed them. He runs alongside of the lost today, seeking them. He has come today to be with a sinner, to save them, and to provide a means today where they don't have to die in their sins and go to hell. His birth is the, is, is the, is the very beginning point today. His birth is the foreshadowing today. His birth points us to his death on the cross for sinners. So you can't have today the cross without the cradle. So Jesus is God with us because he comes like no other. Second, Jesus saves like no other. Jesus, he doesn't save us by giving us rules to follow. We make up rules and all this other stuff. He doesn't come to just try to give us something like that to, to go through life with. You don't become a Christian by following today rules. You become a Christian by following Christ and receiving him. His name Jesus all man Jesus, all God Christ. 
Amen. Jesus Christ. So born of a woman, fully, fully man, fully man. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, making him what? Fully God. So his name is Jesus Christ, for he is the only one that is able to save today. I can't save you. No one else in this church can save you, but Jesus can save you and change your life. The first Adam took us into sin. Thank God the last Adam saves us from sin. And that's the power of our God and what he will do in our lives. Let me just show you this real quick over the next 30 seconds or so. Maybe a minute. Jesus won. It's in your study guide. Fully human. I'm just going to read these bullets off to you. He was like us physically. He was like us mentally. He was like us emotionally. He was like us outwardly. He was like us socially. And so when you believe on Jesus as your substitute, as your sin substitute today, you're believing in the perfect life that he lived for you and for me today. And his atoning death took away the penalty that all mankind faces. Then Jesus fully God. So see, that's what the incarnation is. Fully man, fully God. And so there's four points in that process. He has authority over disease. With his stripes, Isaiah said, you're what? Healed. He has authority today over the natural world. You think, man, this world's in a mess. It is, but God's not. And the only reason this world's in a mess is because people won't trust and serve him. Thirdly, he has authority to forgive sin. Thank you, Jesus. And then fourthly, he has authority over death. Oh, death, where's thy sting? Oh, grave, where's thy victory? Thank God he's taken the sting out of death, and he's taken the victory out of the grave, and he's given us life with him forevermore. Jesus Christ, fully God. Jesus Christ, fully man. And that's exactly what we as Christmas today. What took place was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken had spoken of by his prophets in the Old Testament. So what was proclaimed then was fulfilled. In the New Testament. So Christmas was a display. Here you go and I'm through. Christmas is a display of God's love for all people. For all people. So this is real hope for us today. This is genuine hope. This is hope that changes your life. For in Jesus is the only way today God will be with you. And if you don't have him in your life, your life is empty. But I'm glad he can fill your life with his presence, his power, his glory, and his presence today to change you. Man, I'm glad Christmas is a display. God loves you. So what do you do with this gift that's been given you? You take this gift and you share it. You don't do like Scrooge and run home and hide it under the bed and become filled with greed. You share, you care, you love. And you realize today God's given you a gift that mankind did not give you and can't take from you. And you share the love of God in being a visible demonstration of the love of God. That his love will shine through you. And the church said, isn't he a good God today? Amen. Father, we thank you today for your blessed presence and your power, your spirit, your grace. And as Lord, we close out the Sunday school time. I just pray that, Lord, you will touch our hearts. And I pray, folks, as they're coming in today, will be moved by the Spirit of God. I just pray that, Lord, you will just overtake this room, every heart, every life. May the Spirit of God just today reveal himself to us in such a magnified, manifested way that, Lord, we will be touched and changed today and we will realize what Christmas is about. Yeah, thank you for the lights and the glitter and the, all the things that we see before us. But help Help those things just to remind us to God be the glory. A son came forth, a son was given, and his name is Jesus. And we've tasted of him, and we've seen that he is good. Praise the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together, clap your hands, and shout the victory. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Amen.